Hi there, so uh, welcome to this fifth, fifth lecture in uh, my lecture series on uh, engineering alloys. And this is where we start the second set of four, um, which is on titanium alloys. Um, so uh, this is a, a first of four, and this one will talk about uh, the phase metallurgy of titanium alloys. Um, here we see uh, some fan blades in a jet engine on an assembly line, um, and uh, we'll talk about how we make them. Um, so in these four lectures, we're doing really a primer, or if you're American, a primer, on titanium metallurgy. In this first one, we'll look at the production of titanium, at the phase metallurgy of titanium alloys, and at the alpha-2 phase. In the second lecture, we'll talk about processing in the alpha-beta region, dual-phase processing, the microstructures we can produce, how we uh, produce different microstructures in titanium alloys, and about the omega phase. Um, the third lecture, we'll talk about texture, martensite, micromechanical behavior, and the fourth lecture we'll talk about fatigue, and then we'll talk about some other things, plastic phenomena, melt anomalies, um, after double prime in, in near beta alloys, and so on. Um, you know, three books really I'd recommend uh, on titanium alloys. The best one is Luttring and Williams' book on titanium, um, spring of 2007, and that's really the book on titanium, that is the canonical text on titanium alloys. Um, the older one, or an older one, is Collings' uh, book on physical mortality of titanium alloys, and that's also very, very good. Um, and then there's Donachie's Titanium, a technical guide. Um, that's good, but it's not so much about the science, it's more about the alloys and the properties as a sort of handbook. Um, so those two are the two I'd recommend. They're all in the library uh, at Imperial. Um, so think about how we make titanium. Uh, this is a, a, a very large bit of sponge. Uh, out of a reactor uh, at the World Conference on Titanium, hence the, the ribbon. Um, and uh, the uh, big problem with titanium is that TiO2, uh, the, uh, the uh, mineral we use, the oxide we use, is very, very stable. So producing uh, high-quality titanium is a, a huge challenge. Um, and it's a challenge that wasn't really solved till the 1950s or 60s. Um, so titanium metallurgy is a young field, actually. It's only really uh, invented in the 60s, um, and we only really started routinely using titanium, you know, even in the late 60s or the early 70s. Um, and uh, the Kroll process um, for producing titanium goes as, as follows. First, we carbochlorinate our titanium, so we mix it with some carbon um, and uh, pass chlorine gas over it, um, and we produce titanium tetrachloride and CO2 or CO. Um, and uh, how much carbon you're using depends on how much CO2 mix you produce, and that will depend on the temperature you're reacting at and how, what your oxygen particle pressure is, um, in effect. And uh, the, the point of using the carbon here rather than burning it in a coal-fired power station to make electricity um, and then pro providing more heat this is more efficient. You're using the carbon to make CO2 directly here, so you can achieve a higher efficiency than you would in a coal-fired power station at sort of 35, 40% efficiency plus grid losses and so on. Um, so you get the thermodynamic boost here from the carbon. You could remove the carbon and liberate oxygen if you wanted to uh, in a purely electric process. Um, then having got our, our tickle, our titanium tetrachloride, uh, we reduce that by f putting it in a reactor and flowing magnesium over it. Um, and we do that at, at quite a high temperature, 800, 850 degrees C. Um, and that makes uh, titanium and magnesium chloride. Um, so we reduce the titanium with magnesium. Um, and uh, then this is the starting product for a magnesium process. So we then electrolyze that to go back to making our magnesium and our chlorine. And so they go round and round in a closed loop. Um, and we also add some distillation and purification processes because we still end up with some chlorine in our product, um, which we need to uh, vacuum distill off. Um, and uh, ultimately, uh, then we get rid of the last of it wh when we melt. Um, so it goes something like, like this. This is our, our fluidized bed of TiO2 and carbon, um, where actually at the temperatures that it's operating at, the titanium tetrachloride, uh, will come off uh, as a vapour um, or as a liquid um, and then we take that and put that into a charge uh, of, um, of, a, of a vessel here um, 
and then uh, we put in our magnesium, let it reduce uh, at temperature, so we're in a big vacuum furnace here, um, and then as that proceeds, then your magnesium chloride comes off um, and you distill that, uh, put the magnesium back in and do that as a periodic process. And it takes days. Um, and we separately then have a magnesium reduction process off somewhere else. And that has to produce very high quality magnesium and is also reliant on the vacuum furnaces. So we have a lot of vacuum kit in big cells that run for days and weeks, year after year. Um, and it's a batch process. Um, and we're critically dependent on all of these uh, vacuum systems working in a heavily chlorine containing environment, which is, of course, very aggressive. So it's difficult to avoid vacuum leaks. And it takes a lot of vigilance to avoid them. So uh, we can make some following comments on, on Kroll. So titanium dioxide is readily mined from sand. There are beaches in Australia uh, where you can just dig it up. Um, and uh, it's processed uh, for pigment. So all of the pigment you see, lipstick, paint, and so on, is very likely using TiO2 as a, as a binder, which is a white color, which takes colors very easily. Um, and uh, the so titanium ore, rutile, TiO2, is very, very common and very, very cheap. But it takes an awful lot of energy, something like 125 megawatt hours per ton. It's about four pounds a kilo just in power. And coral titanium costs something like five pounds a kilo at 2003 prices. Um, and the price varies very dramatically in time by factors of two or three or four, um, depending on the state of the titanium market. There are alternative processes. There's a, a process using iodine instead of magnesium, and there's a process using sodium instead of magnesium. It's called the Van Arkel and Hunter processes. But they are uh, using um, more reactive metals, uh, and therefore they cost more. Um, and the, there's also, um, so early in the days of titanium, uh, in the UK, for instance, we built a Hunter plant, um, and that produced high-quality product. But eventually, once the problems with Kroll, with the vacuum and so on, were sorted out, and the, the Kroll ended up with a lower base price, and so that Hunter process we closed down. Um, and uh, there are other processes under development. Uh, there's the Frey Farthing Chen process, the FFC process, and that reduces TiO2 directly using calcium chloride molten salts. Um, and that may hold some promise for the future for making uh, better quality titanium, cheaper titanium, more cheaper than anything else uh, in the future. Um, but that process has been under, develop now, uh, under development now since uh, the late 90s. So uh, it's a long road to develop and industrialize a new process. Um, and the total coal production of titanium is something like 140,000 tons a year, um, which is about a billion dollars worth of tie, one, two billion dollars. It's that sort of size of an industry. Um, so it's a small industry in tonnage, but it's very, very high value. So a single boss furnace, such as you would find in uh, Wynalid or Clamwern um, in South Wales, they have several there, and they do 200 tons at a time, multiple times a day. Um, and so a single boss furnace will produce something like one and a half million tons a year of steel at a price of, uh, you know, $100, $200 a ton. Um, so the price is, is very, very different, dramatically different, an or more than an order of magnitude difference between titanium and steel. And consequently, titanium is a small niche product. We only really use titanium when we absolutely have to. Um, and one of the things about the coral process is that it's a batch process. It takes like five days. And then when you open up the retort, you have to section off the outsides of the sponge um, and uh, put those away for, for armor or for chemical plant use. And it's only the very core that's really useful for um, both the electronics industry and for aerospace. And that's chipped out manually and then goes through a gradient sorting and crushing process uh, prior to then recompacting it back into an ingot, which you melt. Um, and we've talked about melting already. And the, the critical thing is the purity of the magnesium and the avoidance of vacuum leaks in the process. And that's critical to avoiding hard alpha occlusions, as we talked about in the set of lectures on defects. So then once you've got your crawl, um, then uh, you get little, you chip it up into crunch it up into little chunks, 
that are sort of thumbnail size um, and uh, there's a scale bar here in centimeters that on the order of a centimeter across then you can pack them into rounds which you weld together to make a big ingot which you then melt in your VAR process and go around your VAR three times and end up with a nice ingot like this. Um, then having taken that nice ingot we then take it up and open die forge it to break down the beta grain size um, and then do our final finish forging to uh, a near net shape or to a net shape which we then machine something like 90% away and then we've got our disc uh, if we're making a disc or we'd roll it down to plate if we're making uh, fan blades or whatever it is we want to make. Um, so that's our, our production process. So the f next thing to look at when we're thinking about alloying is the phase diagrams. So they're what's going to drive everything, uh, the phases that we form, uh, what our processing options are and so on. And there are a couple of types of archetypes of phase diagrams that we have um, for the uh, there's, there's two phases in titanium, um, two solid phases. There's a low temperature HCP alpha phase and a high temperature BCC beta phase. And uh, at, uh, for pure tie, of course, pure with no oxygen in, they will have a single transformation temperature. Um, and uh, as we alloy, we'll start to open up a two phase field between the two, as we must. Um, and uh, the sorts of alloy elements that are alpha stabilizers are aluminium oxygen, nitrogen and carbon, and um, uh, aluminium in particular and oxygen in particular. Um, uh, the second type of phase diagram are the uh, beta stabilizers. So these are alloy elements that lower the beta solvus. So the beta stabilizers here are uh, elements that stabilize the beta phase, that is they reduce the transformation temperature from the beta to the alpha phase. Um, and uh, potentially you could end up therefore having both phases alpha and beta being stable at room temperature and that's common in most uh, titanium alloys we end up with an alpha beta um, microstructure and uh, these elements vanadium moly uh, niobium tantalum are called isomorphous and there's also eutectoid ones because uh, where you have a eutectoid here um, so things like iron and chromium you will have uh, if you have small amounts, you just lower the solvus. If you have larger amounts, you stabilize the beta phase. And uh, eventually over here, there's some intermetallic compound, uh, TI something, manganese or whatever. Um, and if you get it wrong, you might end up with an alpha plus that intermetallic microstructure. Um, so they tend to be less desirable beta stabilizers if you just want an alpha beta microstructure. And there's also neutral phases like zirconium and tin so alloy elements that don't really change the solvus at all. And it's all in terms of the solvus, that is the gradient of the line that divides the beta from the alpha phase. Um, so now let's, let's look at the alpha and beta phases. So the alpha phase is hexagonal. Um, that is, we have A, B, A type packing of close packed layers. Um, and uh, the BCC phase is a body center cubic. And one thing to identify here is that this plane, the 110 plane in the beta phase, with this crossbar, looks a lot like a basal plane in the alpha phase. Now, the alpha phase um, is uh, unusual in titanium for hexagonal metals. Both titanium and zirconium have this, in that C axis slip is, relatively speaking, fairly favorable. That is, C axis slip, C plus A slip is uh, something like three times the Kutuzov shear stress of A slip. And for titanium, the most favorable slip is prism slip, is slip on uh, this prism plane, the 10 bar 10, along the 11 bar 20 direction. Whereas C plus A slip is a third, uh, 11 bar 23, that is from here to here um, through the unit cell on uh, a pyramidal plane. And uh, C axis slip is. Uh, as I say, stronger, but it's, uh, it does actually have available C-axis slip systems. So this alpha phase, although it's quite anisotropic plastically, has some plasticity, and that's why we can use it uh, compared to, say, zinc uh, as a ductile metal. Um, so in order to think about this, we now need to think about hexagonal crystallography. So I'm going to spend a few slides just reminding you of hexagonal crystallography. 
Um, so uh, in hexagonal crystallography, we have a, a basal plane here, and we define three axes, an A1, an A2, and an A3 in the basal plane, and a fourth axis, C, vertically uh, along uh, perpendicular to the basal plane. Um, and, of course, you only need two axes to define a, anywhere in a plane, two independent axes, so the third axis here is redundant. But it's useful crystallographically. So we define, if you go along here, if you want to go one along A3, you can actually go minus one along A1 and minus one along A2. So we can say that the vector A3 is minus the vector A1 plus A2. So we can make any vector, which we'll call a vector UVTW, in a hexagonal space as being UA1 plus VA2 plus TA3 plus WCs. And that would get us anywhere in a hexagonal space. So, and we then have a constraint, which is that U plus V plus T has to be zero. So, for instance, if I've got a vector like 1, 1, bar 2, O, I'd go uh, along 1, A1s, starting from here, along 1, A2s, and then minus 2, A3s. And that would get me net that far. That would be that vector. So that vector, what you might otherwise think is 00010, oh, sorry, 0010, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, is actually 1, 1, bar 2, O, because it satisfies that requirement. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, so we've, we've got our hypothetical 0010, which was that, which was uh, 1, 1, bar 2, O, um, and using this notation. And uh, so if you were to say, I'm just going to use a three-axis notation, just A1, A2, and C, and if I call them then an R, big U, big V, big W, um, then you would have the following formulae. So my if I wanted to go 1, O, O, A1, uh, so big U's 1, big V's 0, big W's 0, then in this four-axis notation, it would be little u is two-thirds, little v is minus a third, little t is minus a third, and w is naught. So that would be a two-thirds, a third, minus a third vector. So if you do that on our four axis, it's two-thirds, uh, minus a third is that, and minus a third is that. So it adds up to being the same thing. And the reverse is, uh, is these formulae. So our uh, 1, 1 bar 2, O vector uh, comes out as being... Um, if we go back to 1, 1 bar 2, O for a moment, for then that's uh, 2, 3 is U, and then 3 is V, uh, W is naught, and then T comes out of this equation. So if it's 3 and 3, then T would be minus 6. So our 1, 1 bar 2, O vector is uh, in, um, uh, in UVWs would be uh, a 3, um, sorry, just a 3, 3, O vector. Um, so that's 3 of them, 3 of them, and 1, 1 bar 2, O is 1, 1 bar 2, and it comes out to be to all work out. So that's how it works for the real space vectors. Um, so uh, one thing to do, which we'll do in the lecture, is we'll take some three-axis vectors like that and convert them to four-axis vectors, write them both out, and check that it works. Um, now, for planes, um, you have a, a similar sort of notation. If you have a uh, HKIL plane, so then uh, I is equal to minus the sum of H and K, so that is H, K, and I have to sum to zero. And you can sketch those out in the normal way that you do for planes. So if you want the 1O bar 1O plane here, if you start uh, here, it's uh, H is parallel to, um, uh, you've got 
uh, one that way, zero of these, um, and bar one of, uh, of, of A3s. So it's uh, one of those, bar one of those. Start from this point, one of those, zero A2s, or bar one of A3s. So um, starting from here in the center of the cell, that'll be the 1O one bar 1O one plane, vertical in the C-axis. Um, similarly, the 1O one one bar 2O plane, it's, uh, if you start from, uh, where do we start from? Start from that corner, it's 1A1s, uh, bar 1A2s, bar a half A3s. So that's a 1 bar 1 uh, bar 2 if I just think about that correctly. No, it's a 1 plus 1 bar 2 plane. That works, yes. So if you start from that corner, 1A1, 1A2 to the corners, or a half A3 uh, along that vector, which is, if you invert it, is bar 2. So that's then a 1, 1 bar 2O oh plane. And similarly, if we take this third one here, a 1O oh bar 1 bar 1, so we start off uh, from, where do we start off from? So that's going to be, start off from there, we've got bar 1 in C, we've got 1 in A1, 0 A2, so we've got to go a long way in A2, that's the plane cuts through an A2 vector, and we've got a bar 1 in A3, so it's a bar 1 A1, it's a 1 A1, no A2s, a bar 1 A3, and a bar 1 C. So that's a 1O bar 1, 1. And the nice thing about this 4-axis notation is that then the vice zone law works. That if those guys, UH plus VK plus TI plus WL, sums to 0, then the vector's in the plane. So if we combine a couple of slides before, if I think of a vector, uh, I need to think of a vector. So um, if I've got uh, this one, that one's uh, a V, a big V of minus 1. Let me just go back. So this direction here is a big V in my three-axis notation of minus 1, um, and no Cs, A2s, A3s. Um, so that then gives me a little u of minus a third, a little v of two-thirds, a t of uh, minus a third, W of naught, so it's uh, this one minus one, so it's minus a third, two thirds minus a third, minus a third, two thirds minus a third, so it's like a third minus one two minus one, and if I put that into my one o one o, I get one two minus one. Um, and that all adds up such that the vice zone law works, I think we find. Uh, minus a third. Minus a third. Yeah, so minus a third. Uh, two thirds minus a third. Minus a third times one. Two thirds minus a third times minus one adds up to zero. So the vice zone law still works. That's our example. So, um, again, give yourself a bit of work to work play with that, because when we look at slip systems, then we'll want to be able to uh, see how they go together, find out which planes are with which vectors, and so on and so forth. So, moving on to the microstructures, here is uh, the sort of microstructure you get. So this is a, what's called a transform beta microstructure. We have some big beta grains here. These were big grains, three, four hundred micrometers in size in the BCC phase, up there at high temperature at a thousand degrees or so, um, or even eleven hundred. And uh, as it cooled down, it transformed to alpha, and we first grew alpha on the grain boundary. See this white line? That's some grain boundary alpha there that's probably a micron or two in thickness. And then we grew colonies of alpha plates in from the edges. So you see here a whole bunch of plates of alpha growing into the prior beta grain. Um, 
here there's some more there there's some more there and those colonies of alpha plates grow in crystallographically defined directions um, to colonize fill the beta grains so this is a Widmann-Statten growth mode just like you have in steels um, so that's uh, in a particular alloy 6346 that's been at 970 and then air cooled to produce those alpha plates um, and um, this is what happens if you uh, um, uh, take it up to 910 for two hours and then uh, cool it slowly and then air cool. You can uh, get, there's, this is the grain boundary alpha there, um, and you can grow those plates very slowly from lots of different places and produce what's now called then a more of a basket weave structure. But notice that the plates are growing in particular crystallographic directions. You can see some, if we pit look at this prior beta grain, you can see some there, some there, some there. They're at 60 degrees to each other, forming in triangles. Um, so these are growing in particular crystallographic directions they're inheriting from the beta phase. And if you get it right, when you zoom into that structure, you can see that between these uh, micron or so sized thickness alpha plates, you can age in some very, very fine alpha plates. They have the same growth directions, but they're very, very fine. These are, if these are microns in size, these are 100 nanometers or less in size. Very, very fine. So we can have uh, a lot of strength from all of these interfaces. This is alpha, beta, alpha. There's some beta left behind, the grain boundaries. And then in the beta that's left behind, we can grow more alpha and end up with a very strong microstructure. And that's the joy of titanium alloys. We can end up with this so-called lath microstructure. And we'll look a lot about how to generate those sorts of structures. So the crystallography of that is driven by how you get atoms from this BCC structure to this HCP structure. They're reconstructive diffusional transformations, but they still inherit the crystallography of the BCC phase. So this 110 plane here, notice with this crossbar, looks a lot like that crossbar on the basal plane. So we find that the 110 plane in the beta is parallel to the basal plane in the alpha phase, the O2. And the other one is this direction in the BCC, the 111 type direction, is also then this direction, the 11 bar 2O direction, in the basal plane of the alpha phase. Um, so we inherit the alpha phase orientations from the beta. There's 12 ways you can do that. Um, so uh, there's a total of 1, 2 times 3, 6 different 110 distinct BCC planes. And then there's two ways to do that direction, because it's only one of these that are preserved. We'll come on in a moment to look at that. There's a total of 12 different variants, therefore, of alpha phase orientation from a single beta phase. Uh, not necessarily every prior beta grain will have all 12 variants in it, but there will usually be uh, a number of them. And as the alpha grows, here's an alpha last with a bit of beta in between, another alpha last, and a bit of beta in between. So it looks like this sort of a structure, alpha beta, alpha beta. And what we find is, is that the alpha plates grow along the 111 direction of the beta. That is, the 11 bar 2O direction in the alpha is parallel to the 111 direction in the beta. And as you're looking at this, you're looking at the basal plane, which is... Uh, a, a 110 plane in the beta. Um, so that's the crystallography of the transformation. There's a slight shift, uh, which we'll again look at in, in a little bit. Then when we come to deform it, um, what we find is that generally C plus A slip is about three times harder than basal slip, or A slip, I should say, prism or basal. And here are the possible um, slip systems in hexagonal titanium from Lutching and Williams. If you take this uh, A slip direction, 11 bar 2O, these types, so that's that guy, that guy, that guy, those directions in the hexagonal prism, there are three possible slip planes that can go on. Either the basal plane, O2, 
You can also go on this 1010 prism plane, that the prism, the size of the hexagonal prism. There's six of those. And you can also go on this 1011 plane. But the one that ten, you tend to see deform is this prism slip here, 10 bar 10. That's the commonest one that you see deformation on. For different ha other hexagonal metals, you might see uh, basal slip, and we'll look at that when we look at uh, zirconium in fourth year. That, but none of those give you, gen give you C axis deformation, and in order to get general deformation, you need to have five independent slip systems. We learned that in second year. And this will only give you two independent slip systems uh, in the basal plane, and there's only two independent directions in the basal plane, so that gives you two slip systems. To get C axis deformation, would then give us the others required for Taylor's criteria to have five independent slip systems. And 1, 1 bar 2, 3 is that sort of a vector. Um, in, in the crystal, uh, and that can go on a multiple of slip planes. The 1, 1 bar 2, 2 is only one of them, actually. Um, but those then give you enough uh, s operative slip systems to get general deformation and general plasticity, and so it's a ductile metal. And the reason why uh, we usually observe this particular one, the prism slip, is because we're slightly less than the ideal C over A ratio, um, which is uh, if you're slightly above the ideal C over A ratio, then the O2 would be the highest density plane. If we're slightly below, then the prism is the highest density plane, highest atomic density. And of course, slip happens along the shortest Burger vector that you can find in the crystal on the highest density atomic plane. So because C over A is less than ideal, then prism slip is the one that happens in titanium. Um, now, pure alpha titanium, rather than alloyed alpha titanium, tends to deform by twinning rather than C plus A slip. Uh, in the C-axis. Um, so, um, so what that means is, is that even in alloy titanium, we'll quite often see some micro-twins. Um, and we'll come on to, when we talk about micro-mechanisms, explore this in a lot more detail. I'm just putting some highlights in place. So we talked about the binary phase diagrams a moment ago, and we talked about the, the different stabilizers. So now we've got an idea of the microstructures and the crystallography. Um, now it's time to come back to those phase diagrams and have a look at what they really look like rather than these schematics. So this is the titanium-aluminium phase diagram uh, from the SM handbook. And you notice that there's a couple of intermetallic phases here. There's a Ti3Al phase here, um, and there's a titanium aluminide phase here, which we use to make gamma titanium aluminides. And there's even more over here until eventually we get over to aluminium. And so we notice that if we're in the BCC phase, the more aluminium we add, the higher the transformation temperature from beta to alpha, and the wider, although it never gets very wide, the alpha-beta field becomes. Um, and if we want to thermochemically process, we want to do so in the alpha-beta field. Now, the only problem with that is that if we're at very high aluminium contents, you know, 7 or so weight percent, we will enter the alpha plus TI3AL alpha 2 phase field. So... And that is an intermetallic, which we might want to be wary of from a ductility perspective. And notice that because aluminium is much lighter than titanium, uh, something like 7% uh, aluminium in weight fraction is actually something like 11% in atomic fraction. So if alpha-2 is 25%, actually when you're at 7 weight percent, you're halfway there to getting to 25. Um, so you're getting quite close to being able to form than the alpha-2 phase. Um, another example here is uh, tin. And we said that tin was neutral earlier. That is, it has no effect at small alloy contents on the solver's temperature, the transformation temperature from beta to alpha. But notice that there is a Ti3SN phase. So tin will tend to go on the aluminium site of the alpha-2 phase. Um, uh, it has the same crystal structure, Ti3SN as Ti3AL. And so uh, tin will tend to be a promoter of alpha-2 uh, along with aluminium. Um, and we use it tin quite commonly as a solution strength in, alumin in titanium alloys, and therefore it's quite important to think about the effect it's having on the alpha-2, because we're going to spend a while thinking about that in a moment. Here's molybdenum. Molybdenum, uh, at least uh, according to the canonical phase diagram, which is still contested out in this region, um, especially at lower temperatures, um, molybdenum uh, is a beta stabilizer 
that is it lowers the transformation temperature from beta to alpha. There's very little solubility from molybdenum in the alpha phase. Um, uh, so you'll tend to, if you put any molybdenum in, in at all, end up with an alpha beta microstructure, which is very nice. We can't commonly use molybdenum in these alloys. And that's a so-called isomorphous. Here's a eutectoid element, chrome. And chrome, again, has not much solubility in titanium, uh, in alpha tie. Uh, it stabilizes the beta phase, that is, it lowers the solvers temperature. And there's a eutectoid here. Um, so if you end up having crazy, you know, 2% amounts of chrome, you might end up with a alpha plus titanium chrome TICR2 um, microstructure, which would probably be quite undesirable. So we tend to prefer the isomorphous stabilizers, particularly molybdenum, over things like chrome, um, although there are some other things about chrome that are interesting. So uh, one tool for looking at uh, titanium alloys and how beta stabilized they are for different alloy contents is to come up with a, a ready reckoner, which is called the molybdenum equivalent. And this is a way of saying, well, if my chrome uh, was equivalent to moly, how much chrome would I require to get have the same effect on the solvus as molybdenum does? Um, and the definition of the moly equivalence is how much of this element that's a beta stabilizer is required to stabilize the beta phase such that when I quench it, it retains a fully beta microstructure. So for molybdenum, if I put 10 weight percent of moly into uh, titanium and I quench it, I'll retain a fully beta microstructure, at least initially, in optical microscopy. And if I put in 8% uh, chromium, I would fully stabilize the beta microstructure on quenching. So chromium then is a little bit more effective than moly. So if I take 1.25 times the chrome content, I would have an equivalent of the molybdenum content. That is, 8 times 1.25 is 10. So that is, if I had 8 chrome, it would fully stabilize it in the same way as 10 moly would fully stabilize it. Um, if I take vanadium, vanadium is only two-thirds as effective. I need 15 weight percent of it to stabilize the 100% beta phase. So in a formula, I have a right vanadium being two-thirds of the effect, and so on and so forth. So we make up the binary alloys, find out how much is required to stabilize it to be 100% at room temperature, and make this ready reckoner. Um, and a moly equivalent of 10 would be enough to stabilize it to be all beta. This is a really idealized construction, uh, which we should use with care, but it gives us a way to think about complex alloys with lots of alloy elements, just in terms of a number, which is this moly equivalence number, which is how beta stabilized it is as a sort of ready reckoner. Um, so that's the, how much we've stabilized the beta. Now the other thing we need to think about now is how uh, the alpha stabilizers combine. And the key to that is the alpha-2 phase, TI3AL. And the reason why TI3AL is a concern is the following. This is the conventional, or this is 2 by 2 of a conventional uh, titanium unit cell. So the conventional titanium unit cells there, hexagonal, the primitive cells there, and I've made a 2 by 2 version of it. Um, and TI3AL is when I have a core to aluminium, of all of these atoms, a quarter of them being aluminium, and I order them so I form two sublattices, an aluminium one and a titanium one. And to look at how we construct that, we do the following. Take the primitive cell here, this guy, take that primitive cell, that primitive cell um, has two atoms per unit cell, one on the corners, um, there's four at the top, four at the bottom, there's eight corners, but there's only an eighth in each one, and uh, there's one in the middle. So there's two atoms per unit cell. Now if I make a two by two version of that, I'd have this. Um, now make it a quarter aluminium with no aluminium near its neighbours. And that's the only way I, do, I can do that. If I put the aluminiums on the corners first, yeah, two by two cells would have eight atoms in, so if it's a quarter aluminium, I need two of them. So 
I need to put another aluminium atom in. And the only way I can do it without making any aluminium aluminium bonds is put it there. I can't put it there because of that one. I can't put it there. I can't put it there. I could put it there, but then they'd all be in the bottom plane or the top plane. I have nothing in the middle. So I need to put it in the middle. Um, so that's a uh, TI3AL primitive cell. And here's the conventional cell when I tessellated out. So I had it being this, and I've kept on going. So that's my alpha-2 conventional unit cell, and that's called a DO19 crystal structure. Um, and it's just two by two as big as the normal titanium cell, and I've then ordered into two sublattices, an aluminium one, a titanium one. And the condition I've used to do that is to require that there are no aluminium aluminium bonds. Now, think about the dislocations. If I want to pass an a, thir a one third one one bar two o dislocation of alpha tie of the disordered lattice, that's a dislocation that does this. It moves an atom from there to there, or this, or this. But we're going to move it this way. Now, if I move all of these guys, including those, all of them across by that amount, then this is what would happen. This red atom would move over, everything would move. So those, all that top half moves over, including this line of atoms here. And what I've done there, this doesn't cause any wrong nearest neighbours. Um, so this is an okay dislocation to pass in the alpha-2 phase. But if I pass that dislocation through here, moving these guys, so up half a layer, moving these guys and everything above them, then I would get this instead. And that, so go back and forth, this guy moves over and makes an aluminium-aluminium bond. And this creates two wrong nearest neighbours then, two aluminium-aluminium nearest neighbours. So this is called a type 2 shear, and it creates wrong nearest neighbours. So this will be unfavourable. So when we have an ordered alpha-2 phase, only half of the uh, prism dislocations that we normally have in titanium can operate. Um, and so the ordered alpha-2 phase tends to be found to be brittle. Um, and even partially ordered alpha titanium seems to suffer slip heterogeneity. That is, once the dislocation moves on one good plane, uh, then another dislocation moves along behind it, and the dislocations move in pairs. And that then means that you get localization of slip on particular planes, which it's held to make the material brittle. And that's called flow localization. Um, and here's an example of the dislocations traveling in pairs um, from a titanium 8% uh, aluminium alloy. It's been aged to uh, promote the alpha, alpha 2 phase. It's in the alpha plus alpha 2 uh, region of the phase diagram uh, where uh, you would, if you image it right, you can, on a very good day, see some small 10 nanometer islands of alpha 2 phase in the structure. And when you have those, you see these dislocations moving in bands uh, of pairs. Um, and when you see the, that dislocation structure, you tend to find that the material is brittle uh, and sensitive to some un undesirable effects in fatigue. So that tends to be undesirable. So there's a limit to the amount of alum we can put in our alloy. So uh, we then need to think about, well, tin will do a similar sort of thing. Um, oxygen is also an, al an alpha stabilizer, and so uh, we have a, a concept of aluminium equivalence, which is uh, generated around the idea of how effective is it at changing the solvus to stabilize the alpha phase, in the same way as the moly equivalence was. But the concern is about forming the alpha 2, so it's slightly misapplied, actually. We generate it in terms of the solvus, but our concern is about the alpha 2. But this aluminium equivalence then has oxygen being a really strong alpha stabilizer, 10 times as effective as aluminium, and tin and zirconium being weaker. And generally, you want to keep that below about 10 overall when you're doing these in weight percent 
So it is said in Luttring and Williams. So, in conclusion, uh, we can say the following things about titanium metallurgy. Uh, titanium is expensive uh, and time-consuming to produce, and uh, it's a, a, a sponge plant is a very expensive thing, and there are very few sponge producers in the world making rotor-grade sponge. Um, you know, there are three main Western plants for it. Um, and a key feature of uh, titanium metallurgy is the alpha beta phase transformation, which drives all the microstructures we produce. And we're going to look at how we make them next time. Um, the main beta stabilizers are moly iron manganese, and the principal alpha stabilizers are aluminium and oxygen. And if we alloy too heavily, we can result in metastability. That is, we can result in entering a two phase region where, if we age it long enough, we will produce some undesirable phases. Um, and that's true both for aluminium alloying and mo uh, moly alloying, both alpha and beta alloying. Um, and uh, so you want to be careful about how much alloy content you actually put into titanium alloys. Um, and we'll, we'll pick this all up next time to, to think about the alloys in a bit more detail. But that's the basics of titanium phase metallurgy. Um, so until next time, uh, I'll see you around.